will now discuss the appropriate uh, method by which we drape the patient uh, prior to an examination. Uh, this helps with uh, a feeling of comfort and reassurance and modesty when examining the patient. For example, in examining the posterior aspect of the chest, it would be appropriate to address the patient and ask them if it is okay to examine them the back of their chest. Is that okay, Jason? That's fine. All right. I would then untie the back of the drape, revealing the part to be examined, finish the examination, and then retie the gown. If I'm to examine the anterior aspect of the chest, I would do the same thing. Can I examine the anterior aspect of your chest? Sure. All right. Undoing the gown, laying the patient back, then I would bring the gown down anteriorly, maintaining cover over the abdomen. I can then bring the drape up, exposing only the part to be examined. If I'm to examine the abdomen, for example, could you please sit up, Jason? I would have the gown tied on the patient. I would ask the patient to lay down, if you could for me, Jason. I would bring the gown up. and examine the abdomen this way. These are good examples of how to appropriately dress and cover uh, the patient so that the examination can be a focused examination of the body part. This is visual inspection of the head and neck. It is very important that uh, all aspects of the face and the neck are visualized and inspected for any kind of abnormalities prior to uh, full, full examination. First, it's good to take a broad view of the face and neck, looking for any obvious deformities, swellings, erythema, or any kind of uh, deviation of the facial symmetry. Of course, the jaw and location can be assessed, the orbital ridges can be assessed, um, whether the uh, neck, the cervical spine is in correct alignment can also be evaluated. With regards to the neck, um, any kind of jugular vein distension, pulsations, masses, edema can also be inspected. The skin of the face is also a good thing to always be aware of. Any kind of uh, dermatological problems can be assessed at this point as well. Visual inspection of the eyes is also important. Looking at uh, gaze, conjugate gaze, um, noticing the uh, location of the eyelids in relationship to the eyes, any kind of ptosis. Um, also the nares, lo looking at septal uh, location, whether there's deviation. Um, these are all good signs to be aware of. This concludes the visual inspection of the head and neck. All right, next we're going to perform the palpation part of the head and neck examination. Jason, I'm just going to be palpating different parts of your face and neck, all right? Okay. All right. Using the pads of my fingers, of course, I lightly at first palpate and then deeply if I feel it's warranted. Um, the gobella is first palpated. The orbital ridges can be assessed. If you have any pain with this, you just let me know. You also have the patient open and close their mandible. Okay, any pain with that? No. Also assessing for any clicks with that is important. The bridge of the nose can also be palpated. Palpating here over the sinus areas is also important for patients that are complaining of sinus, sinusitis type of symptoms. Any discomfort with that? No. The important places for that are here above the orbital ridges and here over the maxillary sinuses. Okay. Um, for uh, lymphadenopathy, it is important to palpate uh, various aspects of the head and neck. First, starting superiorly and moving inferiorly, posterior auricular, that means behind the ear, can be assessed with light palpation. Then posterior occipital, behind the head. And then superficial lymphadenopathy can be palpated. And then deep lymphadenopathy can be palpated, just medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscles. Submandibular lymphadenopathy, here posteriorly, and then submental here more anteriorly. The thyroid can also be palpated. That is usually done in the following manner. Pads of the fingers, the operator is behind the patient. Just let me know if you have any discomfort with this, Jason. Okay. 
palpating the wings of the thyroid and moving medially. The tracheal cartilage can also be assessed in this manner for any kind of deviation. The trachea and its midline position should also be assessed. This is done by using one hand, placing two fingers medial to the sternocleidomastoid, and placing one finger over the tracheal cartilage. This concludes the palpation portion of the head and neck examination. This is the inspection and the examination of the oropharynx. All right, the first thing that we're going to do, Jason, is I'm going to have you open up your mouth. Good. It's important to, of course, note externally the lips and notice if there's any cracking on the lips, any angular callosis here and here. Also now, I will examine the dentition of the patient, see if the, any teeth are missing. Notice the buccal mucosa, wearing gloves always when examining the mouth and using a wooden palate. Next, looking at the tongue, noticing any lesions or sores on the tongue. If you could lift your tongue for me, Jason. Excellent. Good. Bringing the light in, you can do a further examination of the vestibule of the mouth. Okay, if you could stick your tongue out for me. And then depressing the tongue with a tongue depressor and say ah for me. Ah. Looking in the back of the throat, noting the tonsillar size, any exudate on the tonsils noting the posterior aspect of the oropharynx to see if there's any post-nasal drip, any cobblestoning, erythema, exudate. Also, you can notice between the tonsillar columns if there's any edema, possible abscesses, or any other disease processes. Also, this is a good examination in children to note any uh, evidence of thrush, which, which is a white kind of filmy substance that is present on the tongue or the buccal mucosa. The next part of the inspection of the eyes includes a visual inspection on my part. Jason, I'm just going to take a look at your eyes. I'm going to place my hands on your face. First, it's important to look at the eyes, look at their symmetry, including the eyelids, uh, the sclera, the iris, and the size of the pupils, noting their size and noting any discrepancies between the two sides. Next, I'm just going to put my hands up here, placing the fingers above holding the eyes open like this. If you could look down for me. Good. Excellent. Okay, relax. And then holding the eyelids down, if you could look up for me. Noting any kind of deformities in the sclera or the conjunctiva, if you can. Sometimes the sclera will be icteric, meaning yellow. They can be injected. Um, these are all signs of diseases that can, can be uh, followed up further. All right. This is uh, the visual inspection of the eyes. Next, the patient's eye exam includes an examination by confrontation. This means that I'm going to be checking the different visual fields of the patient. We break up uh, the individual eye visual fields into four quadrants. And uh, we do this by asking the patient to close one eye. Jason, if you could just close your right eye. And then with your left eye, just look at my left ear right here. Okay. And what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to move my finger, and if you see it moving, you say yes, okay? Okay. You see this finger moving? Yes. This finger moving? No. Yes. This finger moving? Yes. And over here? Yes. Checking all four quadrants of his visual field, including the nasal field and the temporal field. Now, we do this with the other side as well. If you can just close your left eye, or you can hold hold a hand over it, we can test the same way. Do you see the finger moving here? Yes. 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 You have the patient always looking right at my ear, okay? And this way we can see if there's any deficits, for example, a hemianopsia in the visual field. Again, this is called visualization testing by confrontation. All right, the next part of the visual examination includes pupillary response to light and convergence. All right, this is done by placing a light from the ophthalmoscope into the eye while the patient is fixated on a finger, checking both direct and consensual reaction to the light with the pupils. All right, Jason, I'm just going to have you look here, and I'm going to shine a light in your eyes, okay? And we first always want to make sure that the room is dim. So if we could just have the lights turned off and checking this side, 
we have a reaction there. And checking this side again, I look at the other eye and we check consensual reaction. That is a response on this side with light in the contralateral side. All right, Jason, just keep fixated on my finger here. I'm going to check this side, looking at the, this eye first. Good pupillary reaction. Now looking at the other side for consensual reaction. Good. And if we can turn the lights back on. Next, we're going to check for convergence. And this is done by placing the finger in front of the patient, having him fixated on it. Just keep your eyes on my finger and moving it in towards the patient, making sure that the eyes follow it and come together. Good. Excellent. This concludes the part for uh, assessment of pupillary reactivity, both direct and consensual, as well as convergence. The next part of the visual examination includes an assessment. Part of the visual examination involves examination of the extraocular muscles. And in so doing, we're also testing cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, the oculomotor, the trochlear, and the abducens. All right, this examination is performed as such. Jason, if you could just keep your head still and look at my finger. I'm going to be moving my finger back and forth while watching his eyes to make sure that they follow it and correspond with one another. All right, you start off in the center like this. Just follow my eyes, keeping your head still again. Moving the finger in an H pattern, noticing any discrepancy in the eyes or any nystagmus. Coming back to center. Then, in diagonal motions, testing the eyes, noticing any discrepancies, hesitations, or deficits. This concludes the examination of the extraocular muscles. Proper examination of the eye always begins with a visualization test of acuity. That is done with the Snellen's chart, as seen here. And this is usually placed at a proper distance depending on the chart. The patient is always asked to test both eyes and then cover one eye and then cover the other eye. Jason, if you could for me, just read the smallest line on that chart with both eyes if you could, please. F-E-L-O-P-Z-D. Great. And with one hand, if you could cover your right eye and read those with your left eye, please. Smallest line. F-E-L-O-P-Z-D. Good. And now release that one and cover your left eye with your left hand. D-E-F-P-O-T-E-C. Great. In Jason's right eye, he was 20-30. Left eye, he was 20-20. In both eyes, he was 20-25. Great. All right. This concludes the visualization test with the Snellen chart. The next part of the visual examination involves the use of the ophthalmoscope which can generally be found on the wall hanging here with a cord to a machine here that generates the energy for the light. Once the ophthalmoscope is taken off the wall, the light is automatically turned on and there's no need to adjust it here. Um, to adjust for your own specific vision, there is a dial on the ophthalmoscope that you can turn, look through it, and adjust to your own ability to see. And once you're done with it, it can be placed back here. Also on the same wall is the otoscope. And this also generates a light source once taken off the machine. All right, the next part of the visual examination includes the fundoscopic exam of the eye. That is the back of the eye where the retina resides. The first thing it, that is important is to turn off the lights in the room to make sure that the patient has sufficient uh, ability to dilate the pupil. Uh, next, the ophthalmoscope is taken from the wall. The light is already on. I have focused it to my visual acuity. And now I'm going to ask Jason if you could just look off at the picture on the wall and just keep your vision focused there. I'm going to put a light in your eye and just keep your eyes focused on the wall, if you would. I first, when examining the right eye, I use my right eye. I place the ophthalmoscope in my right eye. And I approach the patient and I examine the temporal aspect first And then I can examine the nasal aspect of the retina. Coming in closer, I'm looking at the vessels in the back of the eye, following them to the optic disc and cup, and making sure those are all where they should be, and that they look appropriate, and that the cup is sharp and the disc is sharp. Going to the other eye, I use my left eye to examine his left eye in the same manner. 
coming in, examining the nasal portion, and then going to the temporal portion. Again, looking at the vessels, the disc, and the cup. Next, we're going to go over the examination of the ear. First, um, Jason, I'm going to just look at the exterior aspect of the ear, noting any deformities in the pinna or the internal anatomy as I look. I'm also looking for any edema, any swellings, anything like that. Next, I would do a palpation of the ear, the pinna, and the tragus, coming along, noting any tenderness. Does any of this hurt you? No. Okay. Sometimes in patients with otitis externa, they can feel tenderness with movement of the ear and palpation. Okay. Next, an internal uh, examination of the ear is done again with the um, otoscope. An ear speculum is taken off the wall, placed on the otoscope as such. The light is already on after I have taken it off the wall. And I can pull the ear up and outwards to make the canal more accessible. And now I come in and slowly enter the ear canal and I try and go in and visualize as best I can the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane should be gray, it should be completely intact, there should be no foreign bodies in the canal, the canal should be clear of cerumen and uh, the entire tympanic membrane should be visualized. Another assessment of the hearing is done by using what we call the Weber's and Ryan's test. The Weber's test is done with a tuning fork used at 512 hertz. The tuning fork is slapped on a body part. Jason, I'm just going to put this at the top of your head. You're going to feel a vibration. Now you ask the patient to localize the sound to one side or the other. Does it sound different in your left or right ear or does it sound the same? It sounds the same. Okay. If there was a localization of the tone from one side to the other, you would note that down. Oh. The patient's hearing can easily and quickly be assessed by just whispering words into the patient's ears. All right, Jason, I'm going to whisper some words into each ear. You repeat them as I say them, okay? Okay. All right. Doctor. Hospital. Good. Ryan's test also involves the use of the 512 hertz tuning fork. It is, again, slapped. It is placed on the mastoid aspect here. I'm just going to put this back here, Jason. Do you hear that tone? Yes. As soon as you don't hear it, let me know. No. Do you hear it in your ear? Yes. Okay. This is the Rhine's test. The patient should be able to hear it both placed against the mastoid aspect and placed in front of the ear. This relays that there is both bone and proper air conduction of sound. Next is anterior inspection of the chest. Jason, do you mind if I inspect your chest? No. All right. The first thing that we do with anterior inspection of the chest with regards to the lungs is a visual inspection, looking for any rib deformities, also checking the sternum for, for uh, pectus excavatum or carinatum. The next thing that we do is palpation of the anterior chest wall. Jason, I'm going to palpate your anterior chest and have you take deep breaths, okay? Okay. All right. Take a big breath for me. With this, we're checking for symmetry of motion with uh, respirations. The next thing that I'm going to do is an examination of tactile fremitus. I'm just going to put the heel of my hand on your chest, and I'm going to have you repeat the words 99, okay? Okay. All right. And yeah. I put, place the heel of my hand in the intercostal space, and I have the patient just repeat the words 99. Go ahead now. 99. Good. 99. Good. 99. 99, 99, 99. Good, excellent. Just checking at the heel of your hand again for reverberation into the hand. This is an indication of healthy lung tissue. If I was to feel dullness with this, this would be an uh, indication of consolidation in that area. The next thing that I'm going to do is percussion of the anterior chest. I'm just going to be tapping on your chest wall now, okay? Okay. All right. And I do that holding one finger to the chest wall and then just tapping with the other finger. Now, when I'm doing this, I'm listening for the note. All right, so when I tap, I listen to the note of the percussion and I compare both sides. In so doing, we compare the sounds on each side. Okay, the next thing that we do is auscultation of the anterior chest. 
Using a stethoscope, you place the diaphragm over the anterior chest and do the same thing, comparing both sides. Could you turn your head to the left side, open your mouth, and take a deep breath for me, please? Good. Again. Good. Excellent. Okay, so anterior chest wall examination includes number one, visualization, number two, palpation and examination of tactile fremitus, number three, percussion, and number four, auscultation of the anterior chest. Next, we are going to perform the posterior examination of the chest. Jason, can I examine the posterior aspect of your chest here? Yes. All right. First thing that we do, like the anterior aspect, is visualization, looking for any kind of deformities. Upon visualizing the posterior aspect of the chest, we're looking for rib symmetry, scapular symmetry, and midline symmetry. The next thing that we do is examination of excursion with respiration. This is done by holding hands on the posterior aspect of the chest like this, and having the patient take big, deep breaths. Jason, could you take a big breath for me? Following your hands with the respiration, you look for any asymmetry or decreased movement with this. The next thing that we do is an examination of tactile fremitus on the posterior aspect of the chest. This is done, as we did in the anterior aspect, by placing the heel of the hand between the intercostal spaces. And we start this superiorly and move downwards. Jason, if you could repeat the words 99 for me. 99. Good. 99. 99. 99. 99. 99. 99. Again, with tactile fremitus, we're checking for a reverberation at the heel of the hand, any kind of dullness with this examination would indicate a possible consolidation. The next thing that we do is palpation of the posterior aspect of the chest. This is done placing one finger in the intercostal spaces and tapping with the other finger, comparing tones on both sides. Never palpating over the scapula as this will give you a dull percussion. A comparison of the tones can also help us assess consolidation of the lung. The last thing that we do is auscultation of the lung. This is done with the stethoscope, comparing both sides. Jason, I'm going to auscultate the posterior aspect of your chest. If you could just take a big breath on, uh, with your mouth open, and I will cue you. Go ahead, take a big breath now. And out, good. Big breath. Again with auscultation, avoiding the scapula. All right, this concludes the examination. Of Next, we're going to perform the inspection and examination of the heart. Jason, can I examine your heart? Sure. Okay. The first thing that we do is a visual inspection of the chest, looking for any obvious pulsations. We also inspect the neck for any kind of jugular venous distension or pulsations. The next thing that we do is palpation. And this we do with the pads of our fingers, palpating over the different areas of the heart. First the aortic area, next the pulmonic area, the tricuspid area, and finally the mitral area. And this we're doing also feeling for any kind of pulsation or heave or thrill. Next, assessing for thrill, we use the base of our hand, holding it over the lower left sternal border where the right ventricle would be, assessing for any kind of heave, and we move it over here towards 
the left side of the chest over the area of the left ventricle, assessing for heave. Also remembering that over here on the left side of the chest, we're examining for the point of maximum, maximum impulse. Okay, finally we do an auscultation of the chest with the stethoscope. This we do initially in the aortic area, the upper aspect of the right sternal border, then the upper aspect of the left sternal border or the pulmonic area, the tricuspid area of the inferior aspect of the left sternal border, and then the mitral area. If a murmur is appreciated, it can also be followed, that is, listening up here in the neck for any kind of radiation of the murmur to the neck, also assessing for bruies. Also, if you could lift your arm, Jason, here, listening for any kind of radiation of a murmur into the axilla. Good. Next, we'll perform an examination with the patient lying down. If you could just lie down for me, Jason, we're going to do the same thing. The second part of the heart examination is with the patient lying down. Uh, visual inspection has already been performed. Next, I will palpate lightly, again in the areas of the chest, aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral, feeling for any pulsations. An assessment of the carotid arteries is also a good idea. Lightly with your fingers, medial to the aspect of the sternocleidomastoid muscles, looking for JV, JVD. An assessment of JVP can also be made at this point with the patient at a 30 degree angle. Heave can also be assessed at this point also with the heel of the hand over the right ventricle and then again over the left ventricle. Next, auscultation of the chest in the same manner as we did with the patient sitting over the aortic area using the diaphragm, the pulmonic area, tricuspid, and mitral. Again, if any murmurs are auscultated, you can follow these to the neck or the axilla. Next, I'm going to have Jason, if you could please, roll to your left side. Using the bell of the stethoscope, which helps us assess lower sounds, I'm going to place the bell over the mitral area, listening for the low diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis. You could just move your arm out for me, please. Excellent. Lightly place the bell on the chest and assess, assess the patient in this position. This concludes the heart examination. Next, we're going to perform the inspection and examination of the abdomen. Jason, can I examine your abdomen? Sure. All right. The first thing that we do, uh, like the other examinations, is perform a visual inspection. Of course, look, looking for any defects, uh, looking for any distension of the abdomen, uh, old scars, uh, any kind of lesions whatsoever, pulsations in the epigastric area. Um, we also generally like to assess for any kind of ventral or umbilical hernias. We can do this by having the patient cough. Jason, could you give me three quick, uh, strong coughs? <coughs> Good. Now, could you lift your head off the bed also? Good. Sometimes these uh, cough maneuvers and lifting of the head can bring out a ventral or umbilical hernia. All right, the next thing that we like to do is uh, part of the abdominal exam involves auscultation of the abdomen. Jason, can I listen to your abdomen? Sure. Okay. Uh, the reason why we auscultate before palpation uh, is because uh, deep palpation of the abdomen can alter any kind of bowel sounds. All right. All right, Jason, I'm just going to listen to your abdomen here, okay? Proper auscultation of the abdomen includes listening to uh, two to three quadrants of the abdomen for any kind of bowel sounds, whether they're hyperactive, hypoactive, or non-existent. Good. Next, you go about one inch above the umbilicus, place your stethoscope, and you listen for any kind of brewy. Just relax, Jason, and take slow breaths. 
and then you go one inch lateral on both sides from this point to listen for any kind of renal stenosis brewery. Good. After the auscultation part of the examination, a percussion examination may be done. Using one finger, you compare sides. Initially, comparing on the left, Jason, I'm just going to pound on you a little bit here, okay? Percussing on both sides, listening for difference in tone. Next, we start here on the right side. Percussion of the liver span involves first percussing superiorly over the lungs and coming down until a dullness is noted. And then starting inferiorly in the right lower quadrant and percussing up superiorly until a dullness is noted. This helps you evaluate the span of the liver. Next I'm going to perform a palpation examination of the abdomen. Jason, I'm going to be pressing on your abdomen. If you have any pain, you let me know. Okay? It's important that you relax your abdominal muscles when I do this. I'd also like to ask you to bring your knees up if you could. This helps us relax the abdominal muscles when we palpate. Okay. With one hand, extremely important that we also pay attention to the expression on the patient's face when palpating. Uh, this is a helpful uh, assessment of pain. All right, Jason, the first thing I'm going to do here is lightly place my hands on your abdomen. And generally, if a patient is complaining of pain, you assess the patient uh, away from the point of pain. For example, if he was having pain in his right upper quadrant, I would start in the left lower quadrant. Superficial palpation involves placing one hand on the abdomen and feeling lightly with the pads of the fingers and then moving to the other quadrants, feeling for any kind of pulsations, masses, rigidity, and then to the area of pain. Deep palpation of the abdomen involves using two hands, also starting away from the point of pain and always observing the patient's face with palpation for any kind of anxiousness or anxiety. Palpation for organ organomegaly can include deep palpation. For the spleen, we start at the right lower quadrant, palpating deeply, and moving towards the spleen, which is located in the left upper quadrant. A hand can be placed posteriorly to bring the spleen into contact with your other hand. Its tip can sometimes be felt with the pads of your fingers with deep palpation. Palpation of the liver includes coming from the next Jason, I'm going to palpate your includes the placement of one hand beneath the liver on the right side and the other hand placed in the right lower quadrant with deep palpation approaching the liver as the patient is asked to take a deep breath. Jason, if you could do that. Good. Deep palpation with inspiration can sometimes help you assess the border of the liver. With palpation of the kidneys, it is done in a similar manner. A hand is placed posteriorly over the rib cage, and then one hand is placed in the abdomen and deeply palpated with an inspiratory breath. Jason, if you could just take a big breath. Good. And exhale. Then the other side is assessed in a similar manner. If you could just take another deep breath. Good. The appropriate examination for evaluation of peritoneal irritability is as follows. First, an assessment of abdominal rigidity. Jason, I'm just going to place my hands on your abdomen, all right? Assessment of abdominal rigidity is done lightly. You can feel a rigid abdomen beneath the pads of your fingers, and rigidity should not just be midline, but should be all the way across and laterally. Next, rebound is assessed. Rebound tenderness is done with deep palpation and then release. Jason, I'm going to put my fingers into your abdomen and then I'm going to release. Okay, you let me know if you have pain with the release. Any uh, uncomfortable feeling or pain? And that can be done on both sides 
or in all quadrants. Next, especially for appendicitis, a McBurney's point can be assessed. The McBurney's point is one-third the distance from the anterior superior iliac spine to the umbilicus. It would be in this location. Palpation of this area with pain is suspicious for appendicitis. Next, Murphy's sign is deep palpation of the right upper quadrant in the area of the liver which is suspicious for cholecystitis. Jason, I'm just going to place my fingers here in your abdomen and I'm going to push. I want you to take a deep breath and tell me if you have pain with this. Go ahead. Any pain? No. This is a negative Murphy's sign. There are two other examinations that are helpful in the evaluation of peritoneal signs related to appendicitis. Jason, I'm going to be moving your uh, hips and knees around a little bit in, for this evaluation. This is for the obturator and psoas sign. First of all, I will be performing the obturator sign. Jason, I'm just going to be lifting up your leg here, flexing your hip, flexing your knee, and at the same time I'm going to internally rotate at the hip. Jason, you let me know if you have any discomfort in your abdomen for this, okay? okay. Internal rotation is performed this way. Do you have any discomfort? No. This is a negative obturator sign for peritoneal irritation. The next is called the psoas sign. The psoas muscle is a hip flexor, and with flexion, it could cause some peritoneal irritation, and this is also a sign that is useful for the assessment of appendicitis. All right, Jason, I'm just going to have you bring your foot up and your knee slightly flexed, all right? And I'm going to give some resistance here as he tries to bring his knee to his chest. And with this, you let me know if you have any discomfort or pain. All right? Okay. Go ahead and bring your knee up towards your chest. All right, relax. Any discomfort with that? No. All right. This is considered to be a negative psoas sign. The next examination is called CVA tenderness, or costovertebral vertebral angle tenderness. This examination is performed to help assess for pyelonephritis. With a pyelonephritis, sometimes the uh, innervation to the capsule of the kidney can uh, become inflamed and irritable. CVA tenderness will help us uh, elucidate this pain and uh, help us assess this. This is done first by placing one hand over the location of the kidneys, then with the other hand, Jason, I'm just going to pound on your back a little bit, pounding up against your hand to the back. Do you have any discomfort with that? No. Okay. I'm going to do it to the other side now. Any pain with that, sir? No. Okay. This is considered to be negative costovertebral angle tenderness. Proper assessment of peripheral pulses in the lower extremities includes the assessment of three distinct pulses. First, the popliteal pulse assessed here, the dorsalis, and then the posterior tibial assessed in the foot and ankle. Proper examination of the popliteal pulse is done by sandwiching the knee between the hands and feeling posteriorly with the index fingers the pulsations. Next, the dorsalis pedis pulse is generally ass assessed here anteriorly in the foot. Following the extensor hallucis longus, going lateral, placing your fingers lightly, can usually generate a nice pulse. The posterior tibial, as demonstrated on this side, is usually located inferior to the medial malleolus. Palpation here with the finger pads is usually done like this. Good. Pulses should always be assessed bilaterally and their pulsation should be compared. Again, palpation of the popliteal like this, dorsalis pedis, and posterior tibial. A complete and thorough shoulder examination is as follows. First, the patient is examined and inspected comparing and contrasting sizes of muscles, clavicular position, head in relationship to the shoulders, height of shoulders, posteriorly inspecting scapula, the location and uh, the angle of the scapula, also looking for any swellings, masses, aberrations. All right, next, um, palpation of the bony prominences of the shoulder is very important, including palpation of the sternoclavicular joint here, from the notch coming across the clavicle to the AC or acromioclavicular joint, inferiorly at the coracoid, 
and then palpating the spine of the scapula posteriorly, and then here anteriorly, coming down the arm all along the length of the humerus. And again, we do this on both sides. Next, I test the patient for any kind of impingement syndrome, and that is done in three maneuvers. The first maneuver is having the patient relax. All right, Jason, I'm just going to be moving your arm, okay? okay? And have the patient have one hand on the patient's shoulder and bringing this across. Do you have any pain with that? No. Okay. That is one maneuver, across the chest. The next maneuver is to bring the patient up like this and have him externally rotated. Just relax, again placing one, one hand on the shoulder and bringing him into external rotation. Do you have any discomfort with this, Jason? No. Okay, good. And the last one is doing loopy mo movements with the shoulder, bringing it up and around. This is also a good sign if the patient has impingement. Do you have any discomfort with this? No. Okay, excellent. This is a examination for impingement syndrome in the shoulder. All right, next we're going to test ro rotator cuff integrity. This we do by having the patient hold his arms out. If you could just follow me. Excellent. And you can put your thumbs down if you'd like. Good. And keep your hands up, and I'm going to try and push them down, okay? Okay. Relax. And good. Keep them up. Good. The patient with a compromised or torn rotator cuff will not be able to maintain this position. Another method is called the drop arm test. You can just relax and I'll take your arms here. I'm going to hold you up and you can do it this way or you can bring it anteriorly like this. We'll do it in this position. I'm going to hold you up, okay? Just keep your arms stiff and I'm going to take my arm away, okay? okay. Maintain this position. Good. Someone with a torn rotator cuff may not be able to hold that position and the arm will drop. That is considered to be a positive drop arm test. All right, that concludes the examination of the shoulder. A proper or complete examination of the knee includes a visual inspection as well as a test of the ligaments of the knee. First, with visual inspection, you look at the knee looking for any kind of uh, obvious deformity, dislocation, uh, patellar displacement, swelling, a sag sign, which means the tibia is posterior with relation to the femur, might indicate a posterior collateral ligament compromise. Um, of course, any swellings or effusions can be noted also with uh, visual inspection. Next, uh, proper palpation is important. Generally, bringing the knee up to this position, placing the fingers posteriorly, and with the thumbs starting superiorly at the femur, coming down over the patella, palpating the bony prominences of the knee, and then moving lateral. Jason, did you have any pain with that? No. Okay. Next, uh, ligamentous strain is placed on the knee to assess for any kind of discomfort. I'm going to be putting different pressures on your knee. You let me know if you have any pain with these, okay? First, varus stress is placed on the knee. Uh, my hand is placed posteriorly here in the knee and one hand on the lateral aspect of the ankle. I'm testing now the lateral collateral ligament. With this, I place varus stress at the knee with this hand, while with the ankle hand, I am bringing it inwards. Do you have any discomfort with this? No. All right, that is the test for the lateral collateral ligament. Medial collateral ligament is tested in a similar manner, just opposite forces placed. Do you have any pain with this, Jason? No. Again, valgus stress is placed on the knee here with the ankle coming out laterally. Next, the Lachman's test is performed. This can help assess anterior cruciate ligament stability. The knee is flexed up. The operator's hand is placed superiorly here on the femur and one inferiorly here on the tibia and fibula. The knee is relaxed. If you could just relax there, Jason, I'm going to just pull on your knee a little bit. You let me know if you have any discomfort, okay? Okay. And I place stresses anteriorly and posteriorly in the knee to see if there is any laxity in the joint. Okay. The posterior ligament, cruciate ligament and anterior cruciate ligament are best assessed this way. The McMurray's test is done with this limb by flexing the knee, I'm just going to flex your knee up and I'm going to jiggle it around a little bit. You let me know if you have any discomfort with this test. Okay. This assesses meniscal uh, anatomy. By 
rotating and swiveling the heel of the foot and putting pressure at the knee, the meniscus can be assessed. The McMurray's test is done with one hand here, one hand at the knee, and the swivel motion, flexing and extension, keeping the heel of the ankle either laterally or medially and brought down. If the patient has any discomfort with this, this is a positive McMurray's test. All right, the patella can also be assessed for tracking. If you could just relax your muscles here, the patella is moved back and forth over the top of the femur. If there's no pain with this, this is a good sign that, that the patella is in the proper location. Also, for patellar compromise or pain or fracture, the patient is asked to flex the quadriceps, if you could just flex your quadriceps here, and pressure is placed on the patella. Discomfort with this may, might, might indicate a patellar injury. Effusions can also be assessed with palpation by feeling laterally and blotting laterally and feeling a wave medially. This can also be done medial to lateral. Effusions are fluids that have built up in the knee joint and can cause severe pain. The next examination I'm going to perform is the straight leg test. This is to help uh, decipher between a disc bulge or radiculopathy. All right, what I do is I ask the patient to just relax, and I'm going to take your leg up, okay? okay? I just need you to relax your muscles, placing one hand on the patient's hip on that side, and then taking with the knee straight, just taking, taking the leg upwards. You have any discomfort with that? No. Just noting the angle at which the patient can bring his leg. Also asking the patient if he had any sensation of pain shooting down beyond the knee. This is indicative of a disc bulge. Did you have that sensation when I did that? No. Okay. And again, going to the other side, bringing the leg up, knee straight, noticing the angle, asking the patient again if he's had any discomfort going on beyond the, beyond the knee. No. Okay, great. This is the straight leg raises. An easy assessment of median nerve entrapment is to ask the patient to flip his hands over. Good. And we perform what's called the Tennell's test and the Phelan's test. First, Tennell's test is as follows. The median nerve runs here, basically right midline in the middle of the lower or the upper extremity. And you basically have the patient extend and you just tap. Do you have any discomfort with that, Jason? No. The patient may or may not have tingling or pain coming from this area and it could translate into the fingers. All right, testing the other side in the same location, right here, tapping with the percussion hammer. That is, again, Tennell's test. Any pain there, Jason? No. Okay. Phelan's test is also a uh, test for median nerve entrapment. I'm going to have you do the following, Jason. Just keep your hands together like this and hold it there. Good. The patient is generally asked to maintain this position for 30 to 45 seconds. Any kind of discomfort or radiation of pain, tingling and numbness in the extremities, most likely in the digits, um, is indicative of median nerve entrapment. Again, these are Tennell's and Phelan's tests. An appropriate neurological exam generally starts with an assessment of the patient's um, alertness and orientation. Jason, where are you right now? Uh, in the hospital. What year is it? 2002. And who's the president? Uh, George Bush. Good. Patient is alert and oriented times three, as we say. All right. Um, next, a, an assessment of the cranial nerves is warranted. Uh, cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve, is generally not assessed. Um, cranial nerve two, three, four, and six were assessed with a visual examination. Uh, cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve, sense, uh, sensation aspect of this nerve is tested using a Q-tip, which can be found in the clinic. You just ask the patient to close your eyes. Jason, if you could just close your eyes, I'm going to touch your skin on your face. You tell me where, okay? Okay. There. Good. There. Good. There. All right, excellent. You can test both sides and ask the patient if there's any difference on either side. All right, next, um, testing the motor branch of the trigeminal nerve, V3, is easily done by asking the patient to simply clench down his jaw, and at the same time, I'm going to palpate his masseter muscles. All right, Jason, I'm just going to have you bite down. Good, and I can feel his masseter's clenching down. 
Excellent. You can relax. All right. Next, Ted, uh, testing cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve. The facial nerve is responsible for uh, much of the facial muscle movement. So you can test this by having the patient smile. Good. Can you wrinkle your forehead? All right, good. And puff out your cheeks for me. Excellent. This is a very quick and easy way to assess uh, the continuity of the facial nerve number seven. All right, the remaining cranial nerves, um, eight through 12, um, can be assessed also. Cranial nerve 8 was also already assessed during the hearing examination. Cranial nerve 9 is usually the gag reflex and that is only assessed generally in comatose patients. Cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, is assessed by asking the patient to swallow and just placing your hands on the throat. You can feel the muscles swallowing. Jason, if you could just give me a swallow there. Good. Good motion with that. Cranial nerve 11, the accessory nerve, is responsible for shrugging of the shoulders and deviation of the head from the sternocleidomastoid. So if you could just shrug your shoulders up, good, excellent. And if you can move this chin up and out this way towards me, good. Against resistance and to the other side, good, excellent. That's uh, the accessory nerve. Now cranial nerve 12 is the hypoglossal and that can be assessed by having the patient just stick out their tongue. If you could, Jason, stick your tongue out for me and deviate it to the left now and to the right, good. Excellent. This is the assessment of the cranial nerves. The next part of the examination involves the evaluation of muscle tone and strength. This can be easily done by simple observation first. Jason, I'm just going to be bringing these up so I can look at your arms here. Just noting symmetry of the musculature in the arms, looking for any atrophy. All right. That can also be done assessing the uh, lower extremities by bringing clothing up, exposing the body part to be examined, and comparing both sides. All right, next strength must be assessed, and it's very important that strength is assessed symmetrically. So you compare one muscle group on this side with a muscle group on this side. For the purposes of videotaping, we are going to just do one side. But again, it's very important to do both sides when performing the examination. All right, Jason, I'm going to have you lift your arm outwards towards me. Go ahead and lift and bring it back in. All right, this is assessing the deltoid muscle. All right, now I want you to bring your arm up towards your face in a flexion. Good, and bring it down. Good, excellent. All right, next I want you to move your wrist up against my power. Bring it up and bring it down. Good. Now hold your fingers out for me. All right, don't let me close them. Keep your fingers up. Good. Just assessing the deep muscles of the hand. All right, excellent. Also, can you grip? Grip me here. All right. All right. After assessing this, you need to make sure that you assess the other side and compare and contrast any changes. All right. And that will cause a twitch in the triceps muscle here. Next, the biceps. It is easy to have the patient uh, lift their thumb, if you could, Jason, for me, and flex upwards. This helps you locate the biceps tendon in the antecubital space here. All right. Just relax. Placing a thumb over this area and just having the patient completely relax and then striking it. Good. This gives you a biceps reflex. All right. The next and final one, the last reflex of the upper extremity that we always test is the brachioradialis. All right, Jason, I'm just going to tap you here in the arm. Just relax. This is found on the posterior aspect of the forearm here, approximately one-third the distance between the wrist and the elbow, tapping approximately right here. All right, just relax. Good. All right. This is an assessment of the tone and deep tendon reflexes of the upper extremity. A quick and easy way to assess the sensory of the upper extremity is by using a Q-tip with the end broken off, so you have both a dull and a sharp end. All right, Jason, I'm going to place this on your skin. This is a dull sensation. You feel that? Yep. And this is a sharp sensation. Okay, I'm going to have you close your eyes and I'm going to touch you in various places. You tell me if you can feel these, okay? Okay. And always comparing both sides, right and left, left and right. Yes. Was that dull or sharp? Dull. And how about over here? Sharp. Dull. Sharp. Dull. Sharp. Dull. Open your hands for me. You can test the fingers too. Sharp. 
Good. Sharp. Dull. Dull. Excellent. Easy way to assess. You can also assess posteriorly here, up in the neck and posterior back. Dull. Sharp. Excellent. If you could raise your hands up for me, testing the posterior aspects. Close your eyes, please. Dull. Dull. Sharp. 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 Good. All right. You can just relax your arms down. Next, I'm going to test. I'm not going to hurt you, but I'm going to make you feel a little discomfort. All right? Okay. And you can open your eyes now. You tell me if you can feel this. Yes. Okay. So just testing for pain sensation yes. on both sides without injuring the yes. patient. Yes. In three positions in the yes. upper extremities is sufficient. Yes. All right. Okay. Um, examination of the strength of the lower extremities involves similar examination as we did with the upper extremities in that we ask the patient to move certain muscle groups and we test them against resistance. All right, Jason, I'm going to have you lift your knee up testing the anterior thigh muscles good and bring your knee down testing the posterior thigh muscles again you do this on both sides comparing and contrasting any deficits that you notice all right if you could just kick your leg out good and bring it back testing these muscle groups all right now placing a foot under the heel and the ball of the foot if you could just push your foot downwards against my resistance good and bring it up excellent this is an excellent way to test the lower extremity muscle strength. All right, to assess uh, the knee reflexes, a percussion hammer is generally used. And the patient is asked to expose the knee, come down with one hand, and you locate the inferior aspect of the patella here at the patellar tendon. You can also ask the patient to grip both hands as such and to pull apart. Jason, if you could do that for me. Great. This creates a distraction. All right, and then the hammer is localized here, and the patient is asked to relax, and the knee is hit. And that is compared again to the other side. Good. Excellent. This is how we assess patella reflexes. For neurological examination of the lower extremity is similar to the upper extremity, including sensations of dull and sharp, of pain, proprioception, vibration also. Okay, Jason, I'm just going to do the same thing we did with your upper extremity. This is dull sensation. You feel that? Yes. And this is a sharp sensation, okay? Okay. Comparing and contrasting both sides. What is this sensation? Dull. Sharp. Sharp. Dull. Sharp. Dull. Good. All right. I'm going to give you a little bit of discomfort with this. You tell me if you feel the sensation of pain, okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Again, three points here in the lower extremity is sufficient. Yes. Yes. Okay, next, using two ends, I'm going to do two-point discrimination in the lower extremity. All right, Jason, you tell me this is two and this is one. Okay. Okay? Keeping them fairly close together. All right, Jason. How many points do you feel here? Four. Good. And how many do you feel here? Two. And how many do you feel here? Two. And how many do you feel here? One. And comparing to the other side, how many? Two. One. Two. Good. Excellent. All right. Now we're going to test proprioception. Jason, I'm going to hold your toe down, or I'm going to hold your toe up. I'm going to have you close your eyes. I'm going to hold it in the position, and you tell me where it is, either down or up. Okay. Close your eyes. Where's your toe? Down. Up. Good. You compare both sides. Down. Up. Good. You can also do this with the ankle or the foot, having him go down or up. All right. Next, we're going to test vibratory sensation. Jason, you can open your eyes. And again, using the tuning fork, I'm going to hit it. You just tell me if you feel a sense of vibration. Testing here distally at the base of the big toe. Do you yes. feel that? Again, at the malleoli. Yes. And here at the tibial plateau. Yes. Good. Testing both sides again. Toe, medial malleolus, and tibial plateau. 
You feel all those? Yep. Okay. All right, this concludes the examination neurologically of the lower extremities. All right, to assess for cerebellar function and coordination in the upper extremities, you just ask the patient to uh, place his finger on his own nose and then to touch your finger, the operator's finger. So I'm going to have you bring your finger up, touch your own nose, and then touch my finger. Bring them back and forth quickly. Okay? And you just move your finger in space and have the patient go back and forth. Okay, now try it with the other side. Excellent. These are considered nose to finger exercises. Continuously moving. Good. All right, this is an assessment of cerebellar function and coordination of the upper extremity. Also, we can do uh, quick and rapid, rapid alternating movements of the upper extremities. I'm going to have you bring your hands out like this, and I'm going to have you go back and forth quickly. Faster. Good. Excellent. All right. Again, contrasting both sides, making sure symmetry is there. All right. This is an easy and quick way to assess cere cerebellar function in the upper extremities. An easy way to assess for cerebellar function and coordination is to ask the patient to do uh, knee to heel exercises. All right, Jason, I'm just going to have you with this leg, bring your heel to your knee, and then bring it back down to your ankle. Okay? Okay. And you're going to do that back and forth. Okay? All right? Okay. I'm going to let go, and I'm going to have you do that. Go ahead. Back and forth, quickly. Back and forth. Good. And let's do the other side now. Compare and contrast. Good. Knee to heel. Excellent. All right. This is an easy way to assess coordination cerebellar function in the lower extremities. A quick and easy way to assess for meningeal signs is the Brzezinski's and Koenig sign. First Koenig sign is the following. We're going to flick, flex the hip and also flex the knee. And then we're going to extend the knee with a flexed hip. All right, Jason. I'm going to just bring your leg up, just relax, flexing the hip, flexing the knee, all right? And now I'm going to extend his knee, and if you'd let me know if you have pain, and if he does, this would be considered a positive Koenig sign for meningeal irritation. All right. Any discomfort with that? No. All right. Excellent. That's Koenig's. Now, Brzezinski's is using the neck of the patient. You come to the head of the bed, and you just ask the patient to relax. And then I bring his neck forward, and with this, if I see any hip or knee flexion, that would be considered a positive Brzezinski sign. All right, Jason, just relax. Noticing if there's any flexion, there is none. This is considered a negative Brzezinski sign. These, again, the Brzezinski's and Koenig's are for meningeal irritation. The following is a demonstration of how to assess for pronator drift. All right, Jason, I'm going to have you hold your hands out like you're holding your favorite plate of food. Palms up, close your eyes, and just relax. Having the patient maintain this position for a certain amount of time is good, and also giving them traction downwards, looking for any kind of drift. All right, you can relax. Pronator drift would look as such as the patient's hand drifts away. It can also occur bilaterally. This is an assessment for pronator drift.